Hey guys, happy Monday. Um, I just wanted to uh, start out on the screen showing you your agenda for the week. Uh, so today, what I'm going to do is I hope you guys uh, answer your warm up here and then you guys can see that we're doing this online lecture with the PowerPoint. Um, if you guys need to review how to download the PowerPoint into your OneNote so you can like annotate while we do this, then that's the video. And uh, then you guys are expected to take your own notes either from the PowerPoint, which is kind of boring, um, or you can um, eventually click this online link right here for the online lecture. Um, then from there, I'm going to go over, I think, almost all your vocabulary words. You can uh, use that to help you study for your vocab quiz tomorrow. If you are unsure about what your vocabulary words are, you're going to click that link and it's going to take you to the unit calendar and it's going to give you those words. Um, I'm giving you a heads up or a head start. Uh, hey, you have to read chapter 9.3 in the textbook. Here are some reading questions. They are due Friday. And if you guys come all the way over here, you can see um, that they are do on Friday, um, but I just want to make sure that those are right there for you. So I'm going to come in here into OneNote, and I decided that instead of writing down all of my annotations with you and you guys getting to hear me uh, get frustrated with technology and see my hand hit everything, I thought that I would pre-write these out and then kind of go over each and every one. Um, as you guys can see over here, um, I still have everything organized, so this way I know all my World War I lectures are all in one place, and then here's the Russian Revolution. So here's the lecture we're going to do today, and then just kind of as a preview, you guys have a map assignment due on Wednesday, so uh, make sure you watch the video and get that done. So here's the Russian Revolution. I'm going to highlight important things as we go, um, things that I want to make sure you guys are writing down. So um, this is the Russian Revolution, um, and I just wanted to go over that uh, revolution is a sudden change, right? And in this case, the Russian Revolution is going to be a political revolution. Um, we have kind of talked about social and technological changes through the Industrial Revolution, but this time we're pretty much going to focus on technology. So here, let's make sure I've got the, that. Um, so here you can see, I'm calling it, whoops, a daisy, uh, the demise of uh, Nicholas II and the rise of Lenin. So the word demise means downfall. And Nicholas II is the czar or the leader of Russia at this time and the rise of Vladimir Lenin. And so Lenin is Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, um, but we're going to come to know him as Vladimir Lenin. And you can see over here on the side, Let's see if that'll let me do that. Over here on the side, I've got the year 1917 in asterisks. Super, super important. Um, I also want to let you guys know that there are two Russian revolutions that happen in a one-year period. Um, I'm going to go over this more in the future, but um, it happens in February and March of 1917. And then there's a second revolution that happens in October and November of 1917. And it's because Russia at the time was using a different calendar than the rest of the world. Um, I also just circled the Roman numeral for Nicholas II to make sure that we are remembering that I is one, the two Roman numeral is two, and then V is five. Um, so we're just going to scroll on down here to the next slide. And I've got two pictures for you here. I've got Nicholas II. Um, he is the grandson to Queen Victoria. Oh, sweet goodness gracious. Son of a gun. All right. He's the grandson to Queen Victoria of England. We've talked about this before, especially during our World War I unit. Um, and he's also cousins with King George of England and Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, some of the players in World War I. Um, his last name is Romanov. Um, but just remember, just like with King Louis XVI in France, we don't talk about kings and their last names. But I just want you to know that they are a part of the Romanov family. Um, some of the famous traits that they're known for are as having red hair and blue eyes. And neither one of those things can you tell from that 
uh, painting. Um, but I just want you guys to know that that's a thing. Um, and then next to him, you've got this uh, bourgeoisie, intelligent communist Bolshevik. That's a picture of Vladimir Lenin. And bourgeoisie, remember, means he comes from a middle class background. Um, when we say he's intelligent, um, I he's off the charts. He's certifiably just an incredibly intelligent human being. A communist is a political philosophy. It's also one of your vocabulary words. He's going to believe that the people or the community should own and operate all means of production. This means that people are in charge of their own labor. Um, people are in charge of the land and people are in charge of whichever means of exchange uh, with capital and things like that. Now, specifically in Russia, we call a uh, communist uh, Bolshevik. A Bolshevik is a Russian communist. Okay. So moving on here, we've got the basics of the revolution. Okay. Um, so why does the revolution start in Russia first? Or why is there a revolution in Russia? I guess there are a lot of different answers to that. Um, there's a definite growing influence of communism. Communism, as you guys can see over here with my annotation, it's a belief system that the community controls the means of production, right? They take care of the community. In this, um, in the best scenario possible, no government is required because the people all want to work together. Um, and this is a philosophy that was developed by Karl Marx. You can see here in my lecture um, that I have Marx and Engels. Those are the two authors. But the most famous, um, and your vocab word for next week, is going to be Karl Marx, and he's the author of the Communist Manifesto, and he writes this book, or the co-author, in 1848. Um, so Russia's got uh, different philosophies, political philosophies kind of being talked about or shared amongst the communities, much like the Enlightenment happened in Europe in the 1700s. You're going to see communism come in in the 18 and 1900s in Russia. Now, we've touched on this word before, autocratic. Autocratic is just another way to say like a dictator. They're like auto is uh, self. So it's one person's in charge. Um, and so they have autocratic czars. And then over here, you guys can see that I've got czar spelled four different ways. And we kind of went over this during the World War I lecture, I think, when I talked about the Schleifen plan. Your textbook very specifically um, uses this spelling, uh, C-Z-A-R. Um, but in books I've used before, or in old textbooks, it's been T-S or T-Z. But I want you to get used to seeing all four. It's the same thing. So you've got these absolute monarchs over Russia. So that means that no good thing is happening because they're acting like spoiled brats. Um, at the same time, the people, the poorest of the poor are unhappy. So there's increasing peasant and serf unrest. And we've talked about serfs before. Serfs, as you guys can see down here, I've defined for you. It's not only a poor person. It's a poor person who is tied to the land. They are forced to live there. Um, I want you to think a European slave minus all the torture, all the abuse, and anything that a slave in the United States went through. Um, but they are essentially a slave tied to that land, forced to either grow crops or help the landlord with maintenance. Um, their wives work in the, the big house, the manor. Um, they just weren't as mistreated as American slaves were. Um, and so you've got these groups of people at the bottom who hold up society are getting really, really upset. Um, when we see economic decline, excuse me, um, economic decline means everyone overall, either people have uh, no jobs, they don't have money to pay for food, um, things like that. And then there's little industrial growth. So I just want to make sure to remind you guys, Russia was technologically behind in Europe. They were mostly agricultural. So if you guys remember, agricultural is something that we've kind of touched on, you know, throughout the whole year. But this means that Russia predominantly farmed. Um, that was how most of the nation worked. And World War I really highlights the fact that Russia was behind technologically all of the other nations in Europe. Um, they mobilize really slowly because their soldiers still have to walk to the front, whereas in most other European nations, they could take trains or cars and things like that. 
Okay. So all this means is that Russia is a hotbed. It's a hot mess. Okay. It's one hot mess. And I'm going to go over um, some of those uh, reasons. But basically, there are all different quadrants of the nation are unhappy. And it's all going to come together uh, just kind of like in World War I. It's going to be great. So you don't need to know and you will never be tested on Tsar Alexander II. I just want you guys to see what's happening in Russia um, in the mid-1800s. Okay, and so you can see here, um, I've got this little R, and little R stands for reign or when they ruled. We went over this with King Louis XVI, but I want to just gently remind you guys. Um, Tsar Alexander, Tsar Alexander II um, was actually known as the Reform Tsar. He was a good guy. He realized that his job as king and leader of the Russian people was to actually help his people. So he abolished or he got rid of and ended corporal punishment. So it means beating people who were in prison. Um, he uh, got rid of serfdom. He limited forced military conscription. So as soon as you turned a certain age or the government needed you, you were forced to work for the government for 25 years. And he was like, you know what? That's a long time. Let's lower that to 15 years. Um, he also increased public education opportunities. And at the end of the day, all he was trying to do was modernize Russia. While people weren't happy, uh, they didn't think he was doing it fast enough. So he was assassinated. Um, repeated attempts on his life. Um, and if we were in class, guys, I'd be acting it out for you. It was so great. Um, but he was assassinated for not being progressive or liberal enough. And so sadly, what you have come to the throne after is his son, Alexander III. Um, Tsar Alexander III is the anti-reform czar. He basically uh, thought that his dad was weak to give in, that he needed to have a strong hand, and he needed to get Russia back back in you know in order so he became very pro-russia so there was one russia we're going to have one language and we're all going to have one religion so if you didn't fit into that category you were absolutely picked on so uh something he did is he undid all of the reforms that his father put in um had put in uh, oh my gosh had set in you know what? He just undid everything his father did. Um, one of the really terrible things that he did um, that sadly is, is not new, but it's new for us to be talking about, is he was extraordinarily anti-Semitic. And so anti-Semitic uh, hopefully is not a new phrase for you guys, but he basically was against Jewish people um and jewish culture jewish religion he was uh, very much hated the jews and so there's a word in the russian language called a pogrom and a pogrom is an intentional massacre of a jewish village to kill all jews so intentional massacre and this happens specifically only for the Jews, not for any other um, religious group, just Jews. So the intentional massacre of Jewish villages. And the goal was to kill as many Jews as humanly possible um, to let them know that they were not welcome in Russia. Um, so that's the guy that came to power. Uh, and so thankfully he died really terribly. He died from something called nephritis, which is he had a, a kidney disease where his kidneys weren't processing liquids very well. And so uh, he swole up like he was swollen um, and he died and he died really young. He died at the age of 49. And then we get this kid. Okay. Um, this kid is Tsar Nicholas II, and he never wanted to be king. He never thought he was going to be king. Uh, just like King Louis XVI, um, he was very, very unprepared. Now, King Louis came to power a little bit earlier in his 20s, but Tsar Nicholas was 26 when he inherited the throne from his father in 1894. And at that point, he was like, oh, snap. I guess I got to get 
get serious. I need to get married. So he married um, his wife. He was a czar, right? A king or an emperor. And so his wife's title is Tsarina. And her name in Russian would be Alexandra. She was of German origin. Um, and they started having babies almost immediately because he realized that that's what he needed to do is to have sons. And so sadly, he had four daughters first. And then his last child was a son, Alexei. Um, and then not that this is a Russian language course, but that kid's title was Zarevich. Um, so the Zarevich or the prince was Alexei. Um, he has a terrible condition called hemophilia. And hopefully you guys have gone over this in your biology classes. Um, and if not, you guys definitely will soon. But this is where your blood does not clot. And so you are constantly, constantly bleeding. Um, and so you can bleed to death from a tiny little paper cut. Um, and this is really terrible. So um, so Tsar Nicholas II, he and his family, um, have a really terrible end. We'll go through it a little bit, but in the end, I'm sorry to ruin it. He and his entire family are going to be murdered by Vladimir Lenin. Um, so he is a weak and ineffective ruler. Um, just like King Louis, he maintains the status quo. This is one of our former vocabulary words, status quo, right? You're keeping things the same. Um, he was just like his father who was not a very nice dude. So he's kind of like a dictator and he doesn't try and make any reforms in Russia unless he's absolutely forced to by mass unrest. And unfortunately, this is going to happen a lot. Um, now, a couple of other things you're going to see uh, highlighted on this page is I'm just reminding you guys, hey, does this sound familiar? King Louis the 16th of France over here because we have the French Revolution because he makes a lot of bonehead mistakes. Um, and that's what's going to happen, sadly, with Tsar Nicholas. And then you guys have a vocabulary word. It's a person. His name is Gregory Rasputin. And Gregory Rasputin is uh, not a very good person. And he weasels his way into the world royal family's good graces because he pretends to know how to cure hemophilia um, when he doesn't. So he's just a leech and he makes the royal family more hated in Russia at this time as well. Um, you can listen to some really cool short podcasts in the other resources tab that talk about his murder because he dies terribly. It's amazing. So in here, this is just kind of like a family tree that's really, really tiny. So I really do apologize. Um, but right here highlighted is Queen Victoria of England, the woman we talked about during our imperialism unit. And then here um, in the red is just kind of how we get to Russia. Okay. And so right here is Nicholas and his wife, Alexandra, and then their five kids. And then you can see how it's connected over here to King George right here, right? Georgie. And then you've got Willie over here. And then you've got these family lines and you come all the way down here. Here's Queen Elizabeth, the Queen of England today, and her husband, Prince Philip. And then I know all of you guys are really aware of uh, William and Harry. And this chart is so old. Harry had yet to have married Mary Mar Meghan Markle. And then William and Kate at the time had only had their first son, George, but now they've also got Charlotte and Lewis. Uh, not that, you know, that's actually super important because they're not our royal family, but it's just showing how everyone's still a little bit related. So this is a very easy, super easy slide. It's just reminding you guys that this is the beginning of the end. Russia's behind of Europe and most of their modernization. So they don't have a lot of technology, uh, factories, mass production, railroads. Um, and they're really behind, especially with their armies and their technology and their economies. And so they're trying to strengthen their political positions. Um, just so that they don't get attacked and lose. And so this is where you have the beginnings of the triple entente for World War I. So that's it. Um, now, when we come down here, Russia is once again, not doing really well, uh, technologically speaking. And like I hinted at earlier, will uh, Prince 
Mm. Tsar Nicholas II is only going to make changes when he's forced to due to peasant unrest. And so that's what's going to happen in here with the revolution of 1905. Um, there's a revolution that actually starts in 1904 because the Japanese or the Russo-Japanese war in 1904 Russia loses. And if you guys remember what we talked about during the time of imperialism, it was unacceptable for white Europeans to lose to any other ethnicity. Italy became the laughing stock of Europe because they lost to Ethiopians. Well, Russia is the laughing stock because they lost to the Japanese, right? And so this is the sign that uh, the imperial government is collapsing. The empire of Russia is obviously failing if they're going to lose to those people over there that are super inferior. And I hope you guys can tell that's all dripping with sarcasm and none of that is heartfelt. Okay? Um, and at the same time, you've got the assassination of eight government officials. Now, we spent a lot of time before we left talking about the difference between assassination and murder. So we know that all of these people that are being assassinated are politically important. And so over here on the side, I've got that they're mostly government ministers. And these were men, men who were making reforms to help ordinary Russians. And a lot of these reforms dealt with uh, land reform and making sure the poor actually had access to uh, farmland, also making sure that there were democratic reforms, people felt heard. Now at the same time, there's a naval mutiny, the Navy is upset that they lost the war because here they are thinking that they're big, bad Russia. Um, and then they lost to a tiny island of inferior people. Um, there's also a railroad strike, a general work stoppage. And that means people are refusing to go to work because they want to improve their working conditions and make their nation a better, stronger place. So in the end, this leads to something called the Duma. And the Duma is one of your vocabulary words. It is an elected legislature. It's a lawmaking body. Um, now, what's really sad is that uh, inside the Duma is it's mostly um, aristocratic in nature, meaning these are the wealthier people in Russia that have access to, to these rights and these opportunities. Um, but it's still something. Um, now, what's really crummy is that Tsar Nicholas II is still an absolute monarch, and he dissolves it whenever he gets upset with them. Um, he feels that he's a divine right monarch, that he only answers to God. He has a God-given right to be king. Um, and I do want to go over, if you guys see here, I've got G-D, um, and this is to highlight you know, I'm recording this on Easter, but during the week of Passover is our, um, our classmates and people of the world who are of Jewish faith don't actually write out the word God. Um, it's very disrespectful. So if you guys ever see G-D, that's someone letting you know what the word is without being disrespectful um, to God. Uh, so back on task, Tsar Nicholas II would dissolve or basically fire everyone in the Duma when they got too uppity and they were asking for too much democracy. Not on his watch. Uh-uh. So after they were given, like, or it's kind of like before they were given the Duma, that was like a result. They have uh, a terrible event called Bloody Sunday. Um, now, the problem is in every single class that you take in history, many nations have Bloody Sundays. So Russia, sadly, is not special. And the reason why this is, is because church is on Sundays. You're going to go to a large group, you're meeting, you're talking about all of the things that people wish could be uh, better um, and how we should be acting. And so if we just go and we just ask our, you know, our king, our leader, Peter, peacefully and peacefully demonstrate, of course, they're going to give this to us. Um, and sadly, in every single instance, they are wrong. It is an absolute massacre or a deliberate slaughter of the people. Um, and so even though I give you guys the date for January 22nd, 1905, I want you guys to always remember, don't sweat the date unless I really make a BFD about it. So, um, 
at this particular massacre, over 92 people are killed, hundreds are wounded. Um, when we're talking about where this happens, it's the Tsar's Winter Palace, because everyone's got one of those, right, guys? And it happens in this city called St. Petersburg. And I just wanted to highlight that this is an anglicized city name. Uh, we call it St. Petersburg today because Russians wanted to sound more sophisticated and more European um, before the city's name was Petrograd. Um, and at some point, it actually will go back to being called Petrograd. And then today we call it St. Petersburg. Um, and so you've got this this massacre of innocent, peaceful protesters who just want to have um, more rights. They just want to be treated with respect, and then they die. Um, so even though the czar gives them the Duma as a I'm sorry gift, um, it's really not going to work out for anyone in the end. And so I've got all these pictures here, and I've numbered them, right? So um, this number one is an actual photograph of the standoff at the Tsar's palace in the at the uh, Winter Palace in 1905. Um, number two, I want to say, is a movie poster from the massacre highlighting like these are the roots of when the communist revolution is going to come and we're going to gain power and we will crush you later. Yes. Um, number three is a drawing of a heartless Russian man. Obviously, you guys can see him. He's got a sword, and here he is killing your Russian grandmother, that poor little babushka. Um, she's doing nothing. She's even holding a cane. That's how uh, weak she is, and the czar asked these his guards to kill these women how dare he right it's to highlight what a monster the czar is and so once again one of your vocabulary words from before is propaganda and then picture number four is just another drawing and representation of the 92 people being shot down by the guards um so as a part of this whole revolution um what the czar had to give the people to say I'm sorry, is he had to grant them basic civil rights like to vote and freedom of religion. Um, and then he also allowed people to form political parties. They could, you know, have differing opinions and it wasn't a crime. That's fabulous. Now, um, don't get too excited about line C where we say there's a move towards universal suffrage. That's like saying, I plan to grade your guys' work because I need to. It's not an actual definitive, like, this is happening. It's like, I promise that this will happen. Um, and just remember that it's a right to vote. Um, so once again, Duma. Duma is your vocabulary word. Please make sure you guys study it. Um, let's see here. Um, slide number nine is entirely review. Um, this is stuff that you guys should already know. We've tested on it and you guys did really well on your test. So I'm super stoked. Um, so world war one happens right after the Duma is created and Russian people are like, yeah, we're still upset. So, um, we've kind of touched on how this is a family affair. All the Kings are cousins. Russia's getting involved to protect little Serbia. Um, I've got this word here, pan Slavism, um, your textbook, I still hate it. Um, it's in every other textbook, but it's basically the idea that all Slavic people are looking out for all Slavs. And we could kind of interchange that word with like pan Hispanicism, even though there are tremendous differences between the people of Mexico and the people of Argentina. If someone were to hear someone terrible and racist today in the United States, for example, saying go back home. Um, and you're like, that's really messed up. That's not okay someone else of Hispanic origin would step in and being like, stop being racist. This is our home. And it doesn't matter that that other person is of Mexican descent or Argentinian descent or Costa Rican descent. It's just that all people of Hispanic origin would look out for each other simply because they have that in common. Um, and then so Russia, we know, mobilizes during World War One much faster than they thought they, Germany thought they could. Um, but basically, it doesn't matter because Russia doesn't have a lot of great technology. In the end, this is going to kind of uh, shoot Germany in the foot with the Schleifen plan. Um, remember, if you want to make yourselves laugh, uh, the beautiful German language, Schleifen. 
Schleifen, make it just sound as beautiful as possible. Um, and so that was the German plan to win and prevent a two front war. Um, Russia's really, they didn't do well in the war at all. Um, and so many Russian soldiers aren't armed. They're not trained properly. Um, your book goes into this now a little bit more in detail. They train with broom handles and broom sticks. Um, and very few have guns. And it's going to be the same thing during World War II, where the statistic is one gun for every three men. So if you saw a gun on the floor from the soldier who'd been shot, and killed before you, you would pick it up and use it. Um, and so also here's a new kind of piece of information is many of these soldiers are going to desert. Now they're not getting dessert like, mm, I like me some chocolate cake. Um, they're deserting, which means that they're running away or quitting. And the American equivalent that you guys have probably heard is called to go AWOL. And AWOL is an acronym that means absent, without leave. And this is a really, really bad thing. So if you guys plan to go on to the military, do not go AWOL. You will be arrested. So um, here we go into the actual revolution, the actual part um, that's really, really important in history. So um, the March Revolution is the first of two revolutions. Um, and then I do want to highlight that this is also called the either the February Revolution or the March Revolution. And if you guys are really interested, Russia used to use the Julian calendar. Um, and then after 1918, they used what everyone else used, which is the Gregorian calendar. So um, in 1917, there's widespread famine occurring in Russia. And you guys know that that's a lack of food. People are starving to death. Soldiers are deserting the Eastern Front because Russia is losing every single battle. Like they can't do anything right. And Tsar Nicholas, um, your book highlights this, he goes out to lead the troops. So that way, you know, he can hopefully win. And he doesn't. He's basically just helping Russia lose faster. And while he's at home, his wife is becoming besties with great Gregory Rasputin, who nobody likes. He's a really dirty, mean person. So his wife, Tsarina Alexandra, is making a lot of poor choices. And then we get to see some of the same conditions that happened during the French Revolution. There's general unrest. There are bread lines. People are starving. People don't have heat. They're freezing to death. And so at the end of the day, Nicholas, our Nicholas II, is forced to abdicate. And abdicate is one of your vocabulary words. And we talked about it, I believe, during the French Revolution with Napoleon, because he's forced to abdicate as well. Um, and once again, no one cares about the actual date. Don't freak out, right? I just need you to know that the Tsar abdicates in 1917. And when the Tsar gives up his throne or he quits, well, you have to have someone to take his place. You can't just have no government. And so you have something called the provisional government come in and take his place. And provisional is a word that means temporary. So this was always meant to be a temporary government. And the leader of that temporary government is Alexander Kerensky. Now you're going to see here that it's spelled differently because your textbook is trying to be a little bit more, um, I'm culturally sensitive by spelling at least his name more Russian, but it's Alexander Kerensky. So he's going to be the temporary leader by default because he was the leader of the Duma. And so that's the first revolution as we go from having an absolute monarch to a semi-democratic uh, government. Now, the government itself, we're going to go over, wasn't really doing that great, uh, which is why there's a second revolution. And the second revolution to happen is either the October or the November revolution, depending on which calendar, excuse me, you're looking at. And so this uh, revolution is led by Vladimir Lenin. Once again, uh, your vocabulary word, right? Vladimir Ilyich. Ulyanov. And um, he leads this revolution against the provisional government, against Kerensky. Um, there's a documentary that's actually really cool that you guys are going to watch on Thursday, and it goes over the November revolution visually for you. Um, much, much better. And so basically, Lenin is like, hey, I want to create a communist-based government. Russia will eventually become the first communist nation. And Lenin does this a couple of ways. 
Um, so he, when he comes to power or even before he comes to power, he's like, Hey guys, I'm going to promise you peace. I'm going to promise you land. I'm going to promise you bread. Um, and this is just one of three slogans that's in your textbook that you guys will have to look at when you guys are doing your reading questions. Um, and so, but back to what I was talking about, um, Lenin had a lot of time to plan this. And so he had time to plan this from abroad because he'd been in exile. Um, he'd been kicked out of Russia earlier because his brother had tried to kill um, the czar. He was uh, put to death. And so Lenin was involved in revolutionary activity and he had been exiled. So at this time during World War I, he's in Germany. Germany is like, hey, let's send him back and maybe he's going to create problems in Russia. Maybe Russia will be forced to pull out of the war. That might be good. And they were right. It actually did weaken Russia, right? It weakened Russia to the point where he's overthrowing their government. So um, Lenin is convincing the people, coming back over here to number three, Lenin's convincing the people that the provisional government is terrible. It was a bad idea because they're not magically fixing all of Russia's problems in the first nine months that they're in power. There's still a famine and they're still fighting in the war. And those are going to be the two, actually, well, famine is, is harder to fix, but fighting in the war B is actually the biggest downfall for Kerensky is that the provisional government stayed fighting in the war he should have pulled out, but they didn't. So what uh, Lenin is saying is, hey, I'm going to give you peace. I'm going to give you land and I'm going to give you bread. And so the people are really receptive because they're like, hell yeah, we're fighting in a war that we're losing. This is fantastic. Let's end World War I. And this is going to become the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. This is also one of your vocabulary words. It's the treaty that ends World War One, Russia's World War I participation and Russia's participation in World War One, Lenin's also going to be like, hey, I'm going to give you guys land. I'm going to give you guys farm to work on. But I hope you guys are seeing my little green hints. Be careful what you wish for, um, because ultimately people are going to be forced to work on farms, not because they want to. Um, and then he's like, hey, I'm going to give you bread. I'm going to give you food. And this is during a time of famine is a no brainer. Of course, moms are going to love this. Um, they want to make sure that their kids aren't starving to death, just like what we saw in the French Revolution. Okay. Now, uh, Lenin wins the, the second revolution. It was absolutely fabulous. Um, now you have the other problem is that most Russians didn't want Vladimir Lenin as their leader. And so because they don't want him, uh, there's a civil war. Uh, civil war um, is two groups fighting in the same country um, against each other for control of that nation. So we have a civil war in our history, but it's the American civil war. Um, and so the two sides you have the whites versus the reds and everyone down here is on the side. So the imperialists, um, people who support the czar or the empire, at least, um, if they don't support having an absolute monarchy again. And then on the other side, you have the communists. And so I want you guys to start associating communism with the color red, if you couldn't tell by the notes here that we're taking in red. Um, and so you have the people who took those sides is the United States sent soldiers, England sent soldiers, France sent soldiers into Russia to fight during their civil war. That's a huge no-no, um, but they do it anyway. And then you have ordinary Russians who were communists who did support this. And so the whites want to restore the mar monarchy, or they just don't want communism, or they just want more democracy. They've got a lot of goals. They're very disjointed. Um, but the Reds all just wanted to create a communist state. So they had one singular focused goal in mind, um, whereas the whites did not. They were kind of all over the place. And because they weren't unified, um, they lost. They were losing 
it was easy for them to lose. Now, during this whole civil war, uh, Lenin ordered the murder of the Tsar and his family. So Alexandra, five children, I want to say three of their staff were all killed. Um, I'm really sad I don't get to have story time with you guys. Um, it's a really, really cool story. Um, but if you guys check out the other resources, there are a ton of cool articles and podcasts going over the murder of the Romanov family. But the reason why we kill him is uh, you can't put the czar back on the throne if he's dead. And if that's what the whites are fighting for, well, then just take that away, right? Um, so during the Russian Civil War, uh, we have the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Um, and Brest-Litovsk is just a city or an area where the treaty is signed. It's not really important beyond that. Um, and this is the treaty where Russia agrees to give up territory okay, and money or reparations for war damages to Germany and, by the way, the Ottoman Empire, who they were also fighting with. Um, so that way they, they don't have to keep fighting. Now, um, what's funny about this is that the land that they gave up, and that's this stuff highlighted over here in pink, all of this land is going to be the most fertile and the best agricultural land that Russia had to offer. So when we're looking at Lenin's slogan for peace, land, and bread, you can see that when we look at the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, like, yes, there's peace. Nope, got rid of that land you were promising people. And the bread part is to be determined because we still have to figure out where that's going to come. Now, I realized that I said, oh, this is Moldova, Ukraine, and Belarus today, but this also includes some of those new countries that you guys are going to be expected to label and take that quiz on. And those are also including Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And then the area that's going to be known as East Prussia after the war ends. And so that is these guys right up here. And then Finland is right up above. Okay. Okay. So uh, during the Russian Civil War, obviously the Reds win, but if it's not, ooh, so sorry, guys. Okay, the Reds win. I'm just going to write that over here. Reds win. I want to make that super, super, super clear. Okay. And so then that's going to bring us down here to Dear Lenin and the end of chapter 9.3. Um, Vladimir Lenin holds power in Russia uncontested from 1917 till 1924. Actually, it was uncontested from 1921 to 1924, but you get what I mean. So under Lenin, Russia becomes a communist state, uh, once again, the first in the world. So that is kind of a BFD. Um, depending on where you fall politically, this is either a really good thing or this is a really terrible thing. Um, now, while he's the leader, he's going to use something called the Cheka. And the Cheka is uh, a future vocabulary word, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, no. It's a current. It's one of your current vocabulary words. So check. Uh, um, they're the secret police and they're going to torture you to get information from you so that they can go torture other people. Um, and this time period where Lenin and the communist Bolshevik government used the Chekas to keep people afraid and fearful and behaving is known as the Red Terror because once again, red is a color you need to associate with the Bolsheviks and communism. That's why that poster in the back of my room with me holding hands with Joseph Stalin is red. Okay. Um, so Lenin uses secret police. Now, please don't think that Lenin is the first person to ever have a secret police force. The czar, Tsar Nicholas II, had a secret police force. And everyone in the world today has a secret police force. So this doesn't make him different in any capacity. Okay. Um, now what I'm really bummed about is that your book doesn't go over this word, commissar. It mentions it once um, and it doesn't give you any background. A commissar, as you guys can see over here, is a person who is a teacher who teaches communist party rules. So 
just think of them as a teacher to indoctrinate or to brainwash you into thinking that communism is great. And they're going to enforce party principles or belief systems. So they just want to reinforce that everyone is believing the same thing. I'm really mad that it's not better covered in your textbook. Um, but it does lead me to mention a future vocabulary word, Leon Trotsky. He is a commissar and he will be referenced in, I want to say, chapter 10.3. Nope, chapter 10.2. So just kind of keep him in mind and keep that in mind. Um, now, something else that uh, Lenin does is he's going to start the transition from the country with the name of Russia, and he's going to change it to the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, because Russia is now going to may be made up of Soviets. Soviets is one of your vocabulary words. It's basically a council. Think of it as a democratic group, so to speak, democratic uh, group. And these are going to be made up of uh, both soldiers and workers. So it's basically saying we're giving everyone, whether you're wealthy or poor, access to democracy. Um, and so this is a, a new chapter in Russia's history. So no more Russia, Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. But don't mind, you can, don't worry, you can still call it Russia on your map quizzes. I'm not trying to overwhelm you guys too much. Um, so also under Lenin, he's got a lot and he's super, super important in history, not just to me, but to everyone. So under Lenin, um, he also did something called war communism. War communism is also one of your vocabulary words. All this is, is an altered type of communism that's going to be utilized during a time of war. And the time of war that they're using this in, right, is the Russian Civil War. And the argument is that they can't be proper communists if they're forced to have to um, fight a conflict. So all this is, is the government and the government is going to be Lenin and communists making business decisions. Um, we've seen words, uh, like this, uh, before, like in world war two, we call this a planned economy. I mean, because the government is the one planning the economy. They get to control the banks, what businesses make, where food goes. Um, and this is tremendously terrible and it fails. Um, and so after the Russian Civil War, one of your vocabulary words for chapter 10.2 is going to be the new economic policy, the NEP. And so this allows Russians to become a little bit more capitalistic um, and to make sure that the country doesn't go bankrupt um, and fail. And so he's super, super, super important. Okay? Um, and so that's just a little bit of what he did. And so now let's talk about the end of Lenin, because hopefully you guys know that he's dead. Um, so sadly, Lenin suffered from a third stroke in 1924, and he dies. It happens. Um, Leon Trotsky, who was that commissar that I talked about a couple of slides ago, he and this really, really good looking dude named Joseph Stalin, um, they're going to be rivals for power while Lenin is alive. And then he dies. And here's what the sad part is, is Lenin has a secret will. And you're going to learn more about it in that um documentary you guys are expected to watch on Thursday. Um, and in his secret will, he says that uh, Joseph Stalin is a bad guy. Um, he's not a true communist. We should probably not let him stay in power. But the problem is, is Stalin found the will. So no one else like had the will. Um, and so Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin try and vie or compete for power. Um, but basically Trotsky is forced to give up in 1929. You don't need to know that date. It's not important. It's just for time frame. Um, Trotsky flees to Mexico. There are a couple of really cool press conferences that he gives from Mexico. Um, but what's really sad is um, after that, uh, Trotsky dies and he doesn't just die. He's, he's murdered. He's assassinated. And it is believed that Stalin sent someone there to kill him. Um, and then Stalin would reign over the USSR until his death in 1953. And he is, um, honestly the most infamous totalitarian, um, Hitler is obviously the most well-known, 
but uh, Joseph Stalin is is in there with, uh, I think he's sneaky because people don't realize how bad he really is. Um, and then you guys know my sense of humor. I have him down here as my first husband. If you guys remember the poster in back, it's me holding hands with Stalin. And then uh, Vin Diesel is in the corner crying. Um, now, I do want to forewarn you. I want to make sure you guys aren't triggered. Um, the next slide, it's uh, dead body photos. And they're not scary, they're, but it's super weird because we're not used to seeing people after they're dead. Um, and so here you just have Lenin's dead body. Um, Lenin, um, I'm going to put right here. Um, this is when everyone went to go mourn him after his death. I believe like three quarters of a million people went to go see him in the dead of uh, Russian winter, which is crazy. Um, and so why on earth after his death would they still have him on display because yes, his body is still on display today. Uh, so what they did is they removed all of his organs. They covered his skin in a specific type of plastic, basically. Um, and he's empty inside. He's stuffed, right? Um, and he's on display. And we can go today, tomorrow, because there aren't any travel restrictions to Moscow, as far as I know. Um, and we can go to this really cool place called the Red Square. And you can see that it's red because the buildings are all red. Um, and we can go see Lenin, um, except on Christmas, which is when the museum that has him on display closes so he can get his yearly bath because bacteria can still grow on uh, plastic. And they don't want the father of Russia, the man who created their country, um, to be eaten by some lowly bacteria. Um, and so... I just want to make sure. Um, oh, yeah. So, like, super, super cool. Hopefully that didn't weird you guys out. Um, maybe you guys go on, like, a little wormhole search for, you know, Vladimir Lenin and his body and all of that stuff. Now, this last slide, these are always on the lectures. I just never do them with you guys. But um, go through these. If you can't answer these, then you either need to listen to my voice again or you need to reread um, the notes. So um, just make sure you can tell me uh, five reasons that Russia uh, is vulnerable for a revolution. What does the October Manifesto allow for? Why is Russia getting involved in the war? What does the word abdicate mean? Um, who's in charge of the provisional government? Um, what does the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk do? What's a Cheka? What's war communism? And then obviously the most important one of all is who is in charge after Lenin dies? Um, if you can answer these, then you're going to be in a pretty good spot moving forward for the rest of the week. Um, I miss you guys. I'm sorry. I'm lecturing to you in this capacity. I hope this was helpful and more time effective. Um, miss you. Hope you have a really good week. Talk to you guys later. Bye.